thank you everyone for joining us. I can see we've already got 30 attendees, which is terrific. And, uh, and in fact, that's growing all the time. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, uh, Zoom issues uh, aside. Uh, firstly, look, my name's Dr. Andrew Wilcox. I'm Director of International Trade and Partnerships with Yus Mundi. Uh, straight to what we're doing with this Yus Mundi Agora series. Uh, essentially, the Yus Mundi Agora series provides an open platform for the world's uh, leading academics, lawyers, and institutions to deliver public discussions on sectoral issues that are important to international law and international arbitration, but more importantly, are important to you uh, out there viewing this. Um, so the reason we chose this topic, which is sources of international investment arbitration, looking forward, looking back, is to really discuss and unpack the historic sources of investment uh, arbitration that we at Yusmundi, we've taken decisions to pull some of these sources into Yusmundi, into the, into the public facing database. And why would we do that? Why do we think mixed claims commissions are important? Why do we think the Iran-US claims tribunal uh, decisions and awards and results of that are important? And that's what uh, we're going to discuss today, or rather my learned colleagues are going to discuss today. And uh, without further ado, so I've taken out two minutes of our time uh, and we want to get on with it. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Karina Boltag. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in international arbitration at Stockholm University and a qualified attorney at law since 2004 with extensive practice uh, experience in various aspects on international dispute resolution, private and public international law. And Karina is also co-director of the Master in International Commercial Arbitration Law at Stockholm University and a member of the esteemed Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute Board. Uh, I note Karina has also been appointed to Europe's arbitrations as sole arbitrator and co-arbitrator under the rules of ICC. And, and other institutions. So without further ado, thank you very much to all our speakers and I hand over to uh, Dr. Baltek. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it, it's without saying that it is a privilege to moderate, uh, first of all, the first Use Mundi Agora, and second, this uh, wonderful panel that doesn't need any introduction. Uh, so I'll be rather brief because we want to hear from uh, our panelists uh, and just a bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, we'll proceed with uh, short uh, presentations by each speaker, but please uh, uh, put your questions uh, in the Q&A or in the chat. If you have any comments to add, we're going to have uh, about 15, 20 minutes reserved at the end or during the presentations, uh, we'll, we'll pick up on the questions and comments. So please, we encourage you to be active and of course participate in this manner to the discussion. Um, in the order of uh, the topics discussed today, and as I said, it will be as interactive as possible, um, we are going to have uh, Professor Mauro Rubino Samartano, the president of the European Court of Arbitration, uh, arbitrator sitting in commercial and investment arbitrations. And on a personal note, uh, the author of one of the first books I read on arbitration, and it was the first edition, I believe that now international arbitration law is at the third edition. So we hope to see more of those. Um, Professor Mauro Rubino Samartano will deal with, I would say, a very complex topic, but uh, necessary in the context of the discussion today, from mixed claims commissions to the ISDS mechanism, the investment court system and a multilateral investment court. We'll move then to Annette Magnusson, uh, who is the co-founder of Climate Change Council. And that's a recent pos position because we know very well, Annette uh, uh, was uh, the secretary general of the Arbitration Institute at the SEC for many years, I, I believe more than 10 years. And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be named a member of the board under Annette's uh, uh, time at the SEC and of course uh, to have so many opportunities to collaborate with Annette. Annette is going to discuss the future sources of disputes uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, one of the main uh, topics to be addressed will be climate change. Uh, Professor Lucas Mistelis uh, is going to discuss the increased publication of arbitration materials and the future of precedent in uh, ISDS. Um, Professor Mistelis is an international arbitration academic and arbitrator uh, 
Clive Schmidt, professor of transnational commercial law, and more recently, the director of the UNIDRA Queen Mary Institute of Transnational Commercial Law. And on a personal note, uh, uh, Lucas was the supervisor of my PhD thesis, and I had the uh, fortune to work with Lucas for many years and to continue to collaborate. Um, without further ado, the, the, the first uh, Use Mundi Agora focuses on sources of international investment arbitration, looking for, looking back. And we can safely conclude that at least the past uh, 10, 15 years have brought uh, an incredible source of discussion for academics and practitioners uh, looking at the ISDS reform. Uh, I believe that we can, uh, we can agree that at least starting with 2010, when some academics started writing letters about how to renegotiate investment treaties and then moving to the failed negotiation of TTIP and the uh, uh, survey of the European Union, which led to uh, the adoption of, of the investment court system declaration by the European Commission in 2015, and more recently with the UNCITRAL ISDS reform. Uh, I think with uh, to, to, to one way or the other, we all uh, had our share in the debate, in the ongoing debate. And more recently, we see uh, this move towards integrating more and more public interests in ISDS. And I was reading uh, uh, the other day about uh, one, of the, one of the initiatives that is to uh, provide the legal definition of ecocide, which is the genocide against uh, the environment. So let's see where this goes. But we can all conclude that we, are, uh, we need to have an active role in this ongoing debate. And this is one of the reasons we're here today and we look forward to the discussion. So without further ado, I invite uh, Mauro to uh, begin our uh, works. Thank you. In view of the rather limited time available, uh, we have to fly very quickly over the past, the present, and the future of investment arbitration. And you may wonder why we start with uh, mixed claim commissions. I believe the reason is that surprisingly, um, the way investment disputes uh, are evolving uh, reminds in a way of the shape of these old commissions, which were panels funded by international agreements to settle claim between states or between a, a, a citizen of a state and the state. Um, and they, these commissions were very actual in the 19th century in the first half of the 20th century. And the most known of them is the, the J Treaty, the Treaty of Amity, Commerce and Navigation between the Great Britain and the United States. <clears throat> These commissions were replaced by lump sum settlement agreement um, through which a state was settling all the disputes of its citizen. I'm not sure whether this was in line with their constitutional rights. And anyway, and then was splitting the results much later uh, among them. And then they were followed by mass claim commissions. That's the past. Then we moved to the ISDS mechanism, which takes its origin, as you know, and I'll just mention some basic things because I understand the participants know a lot of it, maybe more than myself. So they arise from a, a free trade agreement or a bilateral or multilateral uh, treaty. Uh, and through it, among the various provisions, um, it provides that disputes uh, are not subject to the jurisdiction of the state's courts of the host state, but to arbitration. And the major difference to me between investment arbitration and commercial arbitration is their legal source. While in commercial arbitration, it is the consent of the parties authorized by the legal system in uh, investment disputes. The origin is an international treaty, which opens a, a large window on international law. And of course, the main, and we all know it, the main convention on this is the Washington Convention 65. Uh, the present investment state dispute settlement um, has some positive aspects 
Uh, first, as we all know, it deals with breaches of the treaty and therefore of international law, and not with breaches of contract, unless an umbrella clause provides for them to. Among their advantages, one can mention that they are not subject to setting aside proceedings in any uh, court of member states. They are subject to a rather limited review uh, by an ad hoc tribunal. I'm not sure whether it's entirely good, but that's another point. And then they are to be treated in any member state as a final judgment of that state. Now, uh, there are not only lights in this, but also some shadows and the shadows due to host states who frequently have a feeling that arbitral tribunal tend to find in favor of the investor, uh, frequently do not allow the host state to make counterclaims. Uh, host states object to arbitrators frequently wearing double hats and eventually they have a feeling that the BIT, which they have accepted, uh, places them in a less favorable position. If we move from that uh, and we are in the present, we have the position of the European Union, which has taken a very negative attitude towards the present uh, mechanism. Uh, in their view, it is handled by lawyers who have too many professional hats and who are business lawyers and reason as business lawyers and for a total lack of a full and overview of the decision of the arbitrators. That has led the European Union, as Greener said, first to negotiate the transatlantic trade and investment partnership agreement, which President Trump has nearly killed and probably it will not be easy to revive it. And then it has negotiated and entered into agreements with Canada, Singapore and Vietnam. If you go through these agreements, in a way it surprises because not much of the ideals or dreams of the European Court have yet materialized. And only the CETA agreement, the Canada agreement, there is a clear provision for an appellate proceeding. Appointments of arbitrators are to be made according to this treatise, among judges or scholars well known for their knowledge of such issues. And eventually, as we all know, the Court of Justice of the European Union, starting from the judgment in ECMEA, has found that um, um, agreements between EU member states uh, are null and void due to the non-reviewability of arbitral tribunals determination of a European law by European court rulings. Now, this um, view of the European Union has taken the form and is looking for an investment court system, which provides also for an appellate degree, where judges and uh, scholars uh, who are well known are appointed. In its intention, this should give better result, and it's an issue to be discussed, how much in, more independent they would be. And last and least is a, a multilateral investment court, which is uh, obviously the logical consequence of this approach of the European Union. I'll stop here and uh, let's Thank go on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mara. I, I think at this point is um, I was uh, when Mara was uh, was referring to the mixed claims commissions. I realize uh, that uh, uh, maybe not everybody is aware of the number of arbitrations. For example, the U.S. Mexican uh, claims commissions had thousands of arbitrations. Uh, I think in a span of about ten years. And obviously, uh, we'll discuss this a bit later, uh, maybe when we, we refer to the precedent, that uh, these are still uh, decisions, uh, awards, I would say decisions that are still alive and, uh, and very much present when we, when we have investment arbitration cases. And of course, we need to support one argument or the other. Uh, but perhaps uh, uh, maybe Lucas uh, or Annette, of course, uh, you have any comments or would you, you'd like to add uh, something to Mara's presentation? I have a short comment. And, uh, and of course, I, I, disagree, I agree with everything that Marok has said and he, the way he set up um, where we are today. 
I think from an academic perspective, there's a rather interesting um, dimension that we not always look at very closely with rela- or, or an, 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 an academic slash political. Uh, we've seen the evolution from um, sort of BITs to FTAs to the mega regionals, the CETA, TTIP, uh, CPTPP, etc. Um, I think one of the characteristics of these treaties is we, we went from treaties which were focusing very much on investment promotion and investment pro- protection to treaties that um, cover investment as part as a, of a broader trade agenda. And effectively coming, having investment law coming very closely to international economic law. Now, if one looks, for example, at the um, human resources that the European Commission has deployed in relation to investment law reform, most of the team uh, is a team that is experienced in WTO, but is none of them has actually done uh, any investment claim in the classical sense. So we see that a lot of the policy is, is, is informed of experiences from WTO, which is a state-to-state system. And, 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 and that perhaps is a, is a way of understanding why multilateral investment court system, investment court systems and all on the like are being proposed. Um, it, whether we like it or not is, is effectively emulating or simulating uh, very much what's happening in, in the WTO. At the time, actually, when WTO is not at its best, I mean, it's perhaps getting a bit better now with the New Year's administration. But this blending of trade law and investment law, which at, at the theoretical level is perhaps um, appropriate, creates sort of um, issues of the integrity and the autonomy of, of investment law as it is. Because if you ask some people, for example, in the Commission or uh, in, in this, um, or in the European Commission or similar uh, agencies, they might see that investment law is a subordinate to international economic law and not a self-standing branch of international law. And that's one comment I would like to make. And, and that evolution, I think, manifests that quite a bit. And uh, if I can just add, thank you, Mauro. I think uh, there was a very uh, good description of sort of where we've been and, and where we are. And it brought back some memories on the heated ISDS debates that we had around 2015 and there. And uh, I remember uh, then, of course, representing the SEC and throwing ourselves into that conversation on um, explaining ISDS and explaining international arbitration uh, and the, the shuttles to Brussels and elsewhere to, to have that conversation. And I think, uh, Lucas, you were talking about blending, and I think there's another layer to be put on that that I think we can take with us from that experience and potentially as we move into the future. And the fact that so we as the lawyers, we sit as the experts and we, we, and we understand the technicalities. And I think when this whole issue erupted, we approached it as experts and we went, we went into having this conversation as you would, for example, in an arbitration. You, you, you target the facts and you try to demonstrate why the, the facts have been misinterpreted. So that's that kind of dynamic. That's how you would approach sort of um, convincing an audience that you are right and, and they are wrong. That's how you would do it in a lawyer world. Well, now the world in which this debate was taking place does not work according to that logic. And this is sort of the, the media or the demonstration on the streets kind of world. And that what was very much took over the discussion. And I think because the experts um, somehow very early lost the initiative in the discussion. I think that's one of the reasons why we're actually now seeing, for example, the investment court system being proposed. I think that's part of the part of the background to that. And so I think the learning here is that whenever, whenever there is this need to bridge understanding the legal technicalities, which are extremely important for a well-functioning society, but may be lost because we take them for granted when, when they're just working. But when there is a need to explain that one, they are there and two, how they work and three, why they are important, we need to understand who we're talking to and the, and the context in which this discussion is being had. So I think that's one of the takeaways from this entire ISDS um, discussion. Uh, and of course it feeds into what we're seeing all, uh, still because the, the discussion has now moved into working group three. And that's not to say that the things or the discussions that are going on in working group three are not valuable because they are, but um, they might have looked different and they might have been focused on slightly different things. Had the experts uh, from our silo 
been um, been sort of more active in, in actually talking the, the right kind of language, if you like, at the very beginning. So that's me being critical of, of the way we acted, really. Uh, this. It's, it's, um, it's an important lesson. If we want to be, if when these things erupt in the future, because I'm, I think they will, this is not the last, not the first or the last time where we will see this kind of sort of clash between perspectives and forces in society. And I think this is a very important point, uh, uh, mentioning the fact that uh, the discussions on, on the ISDS reform as an evolving system, and, and let's not forget that this is a new system. Uh, if, if we look as it is today, investment arbitration, uh, we, we can say, okay, the, the Washington Convention maybe was indeed the one that pushed, uh, and also the fact that it is a transparent system more than uh, other systems. Uh, uh, and, and one can debate whether, and we'll probably debate whether this transparency is beneficial or not. Uh, but what is important is that these reforms are happening in different places. Uh, the main one being the UNCITRAL Working Group 3. Uh, and the UNCITRAL Working Group 3, as, as mentioned, uh, it, it's, it, it is a, a wonderful place to, to debate and, and to come up with solutions. But let's not forget that it's focused on the procedure. Uh, whereas some of, if not most of the procedural issues will be intertwined with the substance. Uh, and if one would, would, would like to see this evolving system, perhaps a more comprehensive approach to it uh, will, will have to be addressed. At the same time, the stakeholders, uh, uh, all of them should have uh, probably an equal voice. States are treaty makers and treaty takers, but uh, at the same time, the users are also the investors, uh, but this is part of a, of a bigger debate. And of course, the other stakeholder that has to be in the room is the society. Uh, and I think with this, Annette, perhaps we can move to uh, the future sources of disputes. Thank you, Krina. Yes, so um, I, th that's a nice bridge. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I will just offer then a few thoughts on sort of, um, societal changes as a source of disputes and potentially then throw the net a bit wider than investment arbitration because I think it sort of cuts across arbitration at large uh, and then looking ahead a little bit with my climate change glasses on given my um, my no, new role here at Climate Change Council. But I think it's safe to say that if we're looking at um, societal change as a source of disputes there are um, two things to, to keep in mind. Uh, first, I think it's uh, whatever happens in dispute resolution, and this includes, of course, investment arbitration. It is a reflection of what we're seeing in society at large. So we are the mirror, if you like. Um, and uh, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and just a few examples, when we have seen the growing economies, we have seen also the growing number of disputes in general. I think it was interesting, Lucas, when you published your first survey from Queen Mary, you had a um, I can't remember whether it was in the actual survey or it was one of the academic articles that you published in parallel to this survey, but you had 10 or so different institutions where you had the numbers of cases with those institutions at that time. And then you published 10, 10 years later or so, uh, the same institutions with numbers. Uh, and you could see that the numbers there had threefolded. Um, and, or maybe that was us doing that at the SEC. Sorry if I gave you that you published something you didn't publish, but I, I remember seeing like a comparison between the first 10 institutions in your first survey and then numbers 10 years later. And the, the total number of cases had threefolded in that time. So that just gives you, gives us a, a, a flair for how growing economies will also result in more disputes on a general level. Um, and adding to that, of course, is globalization and what, when that, and what that is doing to our society in terms of in interconnectivity, in terms of con uh, complexity, in terms of different actors from different jurisdictions working together, and also how investments are being structured in different ways to make the most advantage of the world we are in today and what the globalization offers in that regard. And in that kind of scenario, when you have disputes occurring, they will have a certain character. And we have seen it both in investment arbitration and commercial arbitration. We have seen this very complex, very uh, um, time consuming disputes that really have many layers and involve many actors and bring with them specific complexities. Again, it's, it's because the society has become more complex and interconnected and that's what we see in the dispute. So whatever happens in investment arbitration is a mere reflection of society at large. Uh, just if you, if you look at what has happened also, if you talk about societal 
uh, upsets, if you want to call it that, or specific events. Uh, and just using the experience from the SEC as an example, where you had the financial crisis in 2008. And I, do, I don't think this is unique for the SEC, by the way. I think this is something that you will see across many institutions. So where you had the financial crisis in 2008, well, I don't think it is a coincidence that in 2009, you had the most cases at the SEC that we have still have, that's still the strongest number the year after. So you have the sort of disruptive events in society, and this is what happens. And you see that, of course, uh, also when it comes to investment arbitration, where you've had disruptive events in certain jurisdictions, um, and that has given rise to a large number of, um, uh, of, of investment cases. You have policy shifts, you have uh, economic volatility, and again, this gives rise to many disputes at the same time. So this is again an example of the reflection. Um, when we had the Crimea crisis uh, in 2014, uh, or am I saying the wrong year now, 2016? Um, 2016. Then, of course, after that, we had we saw a lot of cases at the SEC where traditionally we would have a lot of contracts referring to arbitration in Stockholm being concluded in that part of the world. And as a result of that crisis, you saw a lot of the cases in Stockholm. So again, something happens to society; it appears in the disputes. And it, I think it's yet too early to draw any conclusions from the pandemic, but it's uh, certainly true uh, in Stockholm and potentially other places as well that. Uh, we have seen a large increase of cases in Stockholm during last year. So 2020 was actually the second most, um, uh, most cases in, at, the, uh, at the SEC in Stockholm after 2009. Uh, so is that a coincidence or, or is this sort of um, tied to the fact that we had, we had the pandemic and all the disruption as, uh, af after that? Uh, again, I think it's too early to tell, but I do think it's, it's worth taking note of. So. Uh, this, these are some of the things that we know from, from, from the past that um, whatever is going on in society at large and the way, the way society is evolving, that's something we will have to deal with in disputes and that's something we need to be prepared for in disputes. Uh, and if we look then into the future, uh, what the field that I am specifically interested in, of course, is how uh, hopefully an, an increased focus on climate change issues, how that will overlap with, uh, with international arbitration in general and with international investment arbitration. Um, one obvious uh, overlap or one obvious connection there is that, uh, that investments, an increasing amount of investments will be crucial for the climate change crisis. So to meet the, uh, the reduction targets for 2030 or for the net zero targets for 2050, um, there will be, it needs to be a massive scaling up of investments across, across the sector. We're, we're looking at a major societal change to meet the climate change targets. So that goes for energy uh, submission, um, transmission, it goes for energy supply, it goes for transport, infrastructure at large. Uh, a lot of these societal uh, systems uh, that we have had in the past needs to be transitioned into a low carbon economy. So that will require large investments, a lot of capital. Uh, a lot of this is already happening, but it needs to be, be scaled up uh, quite substantially. Um, and uh, there is also rising pressure from investors uh, uh, to actually have a greater awareness of the climate change uh, aspects in their investments, in their portfolios, and as they are talking to, uh, the, corp to the corporates. Uh, and many, many corporations are advancing their commitments towards net zero and they're putting at climate change fairly high up on their agenda or even at the top of their sort of strat strategic agenda. So there are many positive trends currently happening in the private sector. Um, and again, I think with this large increase of focus on these issues from the corporate side, this is something that we will, um, we can expect to see more of in the future also in investment arbitration. Because as we all know, if you have a, if you have a certain number of, of uh, deals being struck or investments being made, unfortunately, we know that we, a small portion of those will end up in a dispute. That's just the natural way of things. That's the human factor, if you like. That's we, this, this we know. There will never be a, a world in which none of the contracts concluded, none of the investments made will lead to a dispute. So we need to be prepared for this. And, and when I say hopefully, it's not that I hope for more disputes, I just hope for the, the, the mere size of these investments to increase. And therefore I hope that we will also, also see them in investment arbitration because that will be an illustration of the fact that the, these investments are now happening at a larger scale. Um, now there could also be different types of dis disputes also obviously occurring. So as we see new uh, commercial agreements being made, new, new ways of organizing markets uh, being made. 
and then you could have disputes uh, occurring as a result of that. That's another element that is tied to the climate change crisis per se. Uh, currently now leading up to the COP26 in Glasgow, one of the articles in the Paris Agreement currently being, there's a lot of preparations revolving around that is, is um, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement on voluntary cooperation. And this is sort of under this article that much of the contributions from the private sector is expected to occur. And one of the ways in, in which this is hopefully will be occurring is under the so-called voluntary carbon markets. Now, when we have the signing of the voluntary carbon markets, and what happens to the disputes that might occur as a result of this new commercial activity or this new way of structuring um, corporates. Uh, that could be one area which we have not seen so much before, where we hopefully will see more uh, in the future. Uh, so there uh, are many things to, to, uh, to look out for. And I, and I think if you look at all the parameters that we have ahead of us, uh, when it comes to climate change and investments, uh, and another element to keep in mind is the fact that much of the technology that we need to meet the climate change targets are yet in the very early stages of their development. Uh, the International Energy Agency noted uh, in their report on um, uh, a, ro a roadmap for the global energy sector next year by 2050, their big report released earlier this spring, um, they noted that about half of the reductions to get to the net zero emissions in 2050, they will need to come from technolo technologies that are not yet ready for market. So that means they are at this sort of research and development stage. So if you add all this together, you know, you have new technology, you have potentially a new policy, you could have potentially many new actors that could also be inexperienced. And you combine all of these factors with the speed with which this needs to happen, uh, because we don't have much time. We want to have reduced emissions uh, in half by 2030. Um, all of this mixed together is a, a fairly uh, um, strong cocktail, if you like, for potential disputes, the, the disputes in the future. Uh, and now, and add to that, obviously, if you're talking about investment arbitration, uh, politics, the factor of politics, and what that leads to in terms of instability of policies. And sitting in Sweden, where currently we don't even have a government in place, uh, where sort of it's an illustration of the fact that things can happen unexpectedly that really spills over when it comes to policy, and that will have consequences for how you do business. Um, this all tied together will... Um, probably be visible also in investment arbitration um, in the future. All of these factors combine. So I think I'll just stop there and open up for some comments. It's, uh, it's very interesting. And of course, we, we look forward to see the future maybe uh, uh, normal in, in a normal shape, uh, or at least in person. But one thing uh, that, that uh, was very relevant saying it's all, all, all this, and, and of course, we have uh, this uh, goals uh, already set for 2030 when it comes to uh, the, the clean energy package and so on. But we are still in the phase of trying to adjust the treaties, the relevant treaties to the new reality. And one great example is the Energy Charter Treaty that is currently in the process of modernization. And one of the major issue is the fact that uh, as, as it is and as it was built in, in 1994, uh, uh, it was too, uh, with the view of the fossil fuel uh, energy. And, and that is one of the main issues that we need to probably speed up the process of adjusting this regulatory, this legal framework to the new realities, while uh, I would assume allowing investors at the same time to uh, to maybe adjust to this and, uh, and uh, as you're saying, technologies, not only this, but what, you, what do you do with the old investments? What do you do with the fact that you planned an investment, let's say you have a concession for, for, uh, for 90 years and suddenly the reality is completely new. To this, the politics, as, as Annette was saying, uh, uh, which probably is, is uh, one very important factor to consider. As you could hear in, in, in the last uh, week or so, we had an unexpected development, I would say, with the ICSID convention that Ecuador rejoined uh, the ICSID. And I believe yesterday, the constitutional court said that uh, the president could sign and no ratification was needed from the parliament. Uh, at the same time, I understand that Peru is contemplating leaving the ICSID convention. So we never know uh, what the future brings, but maybe uh, Lucas or Mauro, you have co comments to uh, Annette's presentation. Well, on what you're saying, Krina, unfortunately also Chile has a, a 
Constitutional Reform Committee, and that committee also had decided to take similar steps as Peru. Um, um, hearing colleagues from Chile, some people say that uh, they will never go that far. There might be some sort of tempering of what's happening, but but you never know. Um, I think I think uh, what um, um, and and net um, makes us a point uh, is, is 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 critical. Uh, I, I think uh, society changes and 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 going sometimes back to basics and looking at um, sort of uh, critical obligations that state has, whether that's um, dealing with climate change, looking at, 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 at where we are in terms of environment, are, are indeed very critical. Um, um, I, I'm skeptical about not that process as such, um, but that process being used or abused for other purposes. For example, um, uh, the, the so-called modernization of, of um, of the ECT, it is like modernizing your house and um, introducing 1960s decoration. Everything is orange and, and gray. Um, uh, so but some of these terms are relative terms. But what I think um, I have to agree entirely with, with Annette is that we have seen in the last 15, 20 years, a, a very clear commitment to look at, at sustainable development a bit more closely and now we've seen that almost every law firm, universities are catching up, um, are having an ESG group um, that looks at environmental, social responsibility, and governance matters. And each of these ESG groups in every of the big, in every big law firm would have a number of public international lawyers and a couple of arbitration lawyers involved. I think I think that seems to me to be becoming an area where there would be concrete commitments that the states would have to. Uh, undertake and, and of course a few BITs already reflect this type of language. I mean um, there was attempts to reflect that language from the Norwegian BIT uh, uh, which draft which never became the official draft. Um, uh, the, the new Dutch BIT, if we look at Indian BITs, um, model BITs and another and also the whole broader business and human rights commi commi um, commitments which will reflect um, both on the obligations of the state but also the obligations of the investor. Um, and the, the technology that relates to climate change, as Annette was saying, would also bring about um, uh, more high-tech disputes in the uh, investment fear, um, sphere. And there's a number of working groups, including within Ancitral, that explore whether that's one of the new points of attention. That's perhaps the, the more, if we avant-garde view within Ancitral, but you see from the other side, for example, Switzerland, uh, have, wants to do something on adjudication, which is perhaps same old, I would say. But 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 you see that the, the the different trends, and 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 with some of them, the ESG and business human rights is not just being modern; is actually being looking at very essential demands that we have, um, uh, because if we miss that that train or, or that boat, I, th I think our kids would not be kind to us. I would like to make a, a quick comment in general on uh, the future of investment arbitration. Uh, normal people never fix something which has not broken. Uh, many host states believe that uh, the present uh, mechanism is broken and uh, among the many reasons, there is one which they are not happy of the arbitrators. They feel either because of the double heading or the way they behave or the friendship, the links they have, that's not good. And second, they have the impression that on many occasions, the investor is making much more money out of the litigation than he would have made out of performing his task. Now, um, where all this can lead, uh, seems to me that there is a fundamental choice between arbitration and court system. If one remains with arbitration, perhaps it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel. One could use the Washington Convention, which has worked very, very well, by just providing that the arbitrators, the three arbitrators are all appointed by ICSID. So there was no risk 
that arbitrators appointed by a party favor that party. If one is not happy with that, and some states perhaps don't like to have to litigate with uh, an individual, a private individual, then the alternative is inevitably only public arbitration. And public arbitration would, to me, mean the impossible that each uh, free trade agreement, each BIT has its own court. Inevitably, one would have to go to an international investment court and the experience with the Washington Convention shows that it would be an extremely long exercise. And here again, perhaps there is good reason to reconsider why reinvent the wheel, why not use the Washington Convention just by replacing the appointment system uh, of arbitrators. Thank you. We, we thank you very much, uh, Maro and Lucas and, and Annette. I, I, I'll take the opportunity to ask one of the many questions we, we already have in the Q&A. And uh, looking at the future, one of the questions coming from uh, Wojciech um, refers to what Annette uh, was saying, that there is um, keep an eye on the politics, because at least in investment arbitration, uh, that's 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 relevant, um, and uh, you're actually referring to Crimea. Wojciech is also referring to Crimea. Um, now, the the question is focused on the role of the arbitrators, obviously, because uh, when you have this mix of politics and uh, rights, uh, then uh, it might become a ticking bomb. So the question is, um, drawing upon Mrs. Magnusson's remarks on this as reflection of reality and the role of politics, investment tribunals sometimes face, face high profile disputes arising from internationally relevant disputes going beyond legal or investment context, example, Crimea. Thus, they have to decide on public international law matters. It appears this might be another way to carry on lawfare when standing courts uh, example of the ICJ are not available or effective. How on the one hand to ensure coherence with public international law decision of investment tribunals and to save the ISDS from being involved in true legal proxy wars, uh, unless it doesn't need to be saved from that. Uh, wh where do we draw the line? Are the arbitrators prepared? I mean, we've seen the, the quite a few number of, uh, of uh, disputes with uh, involving the Crimea uh, uh, situation uh, and and uh, and there is uh, arbitrators are, are making a great effort not to step uh, perhaps too much into this sensitive issues. Any? I, I have a temptation to say something here. When I was a law student and I was educated in primarily in the European continent, the view that was taken is that um, there are two versions of um, um, international law, the one that the Europeans um, espouse, and therefore international law, public international law is technical law. There's no politics as attached to that. And, the, and then there's the more American, um, not Anglo-American, American perspective where um, law, international law and international affairs is somehow very much looked together. And of course, international affairs deals with, with politics to some extent uh, as well. So I, I think that you will find a lot of um, um, arbitrators with a good understand. I mean, with a good understanding of international law, that they would not hesitate to apply the treaty as they think the treaty should apply, and completely ignore the politics of, of that. Um, and and for for example, I, I, I'm I'm well known for having I, I have lived in Ukraine for 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 some time in the 1990s, and and I have a lot of sympathy for the country. But, but the fact that uh, Ukrainian oligarchs and Ukrainian banks have brought a number of cases against Russia on the context of Crimea, in so many respects shows that, um, that, that, that the, the, the Russian position that the annexation is, 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 means that, that uh, Crimea is a territory of Russia is the end of the story. It might not be what Ukraine wants, but that's what effectively all of these claims um, bring as a natural conclusion. So, and, and I'm saying that in a more, in a technical, not in a political sense. So um, it, it, the, the lines are thin um, and there are lines, 
but sometimes it's the point of departure which matters, not the not the conclusion. The the other question that we had in the chat, and I think uh, I would like to ask now, uh, refers to the recent ruling of the courts on the reduction of emissions. Uh, I think the Dutch courts are quite well advanced on these matters. Uh, and the question we have uh, from Sidant in the in the in the chat is, um, if this development can or is likely to be reflected in international investment arbitration. And I think this uh, probably the question is: can, can arbitrators deal with these matters? Do they have, as at at, the, at this point, uh, the ammunition to to do so? If I just a few words, I think um, uh, if you look at the, the the decision from the court in the Netherlands, I think uh, uh, at least. Uh, um, from my perspective, I think even the ammunition used by the court in the Netherlands was to, uh, to some extent a bit surprising. Uh, at least the, 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 the large toolbox they used in terms of in, in their reasoning. So they're referring both to the Paris Agreement and, and, um, and, and instruments of international law, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but also they had referring to soft law to a fairly large extent. So I think that is, that is, is in and of itself quite interesting to see. Um, the tools that was used by by the Dutch court. So whether in a tribunal could use, I think it's, I mean, it all will boil down to what kind of claim are you filing and under what instrument and what does that instrument tell you what you have to your availability when you are deciding the case. And, uh, and that is a very boring answer uh, from a lawyer. But I suppose but, but that's really what we have to go back to, right? So what are the instruments? What does the claim look like? And what are the facts? And, uh, and then from that, the tribunal to look what, what tools they can be using. But I, I think the decision from the Dutch court illustrates that there is, um, there is a, and, and we have seen it also in climate change litigation worldwide. There is a growing awareness and a growing um, um, likelihood of, of uh, decision makers acknowledging uh, the dangers and the urgency of climate change and looking widely when it comes to what are we, what kind of sources are we applying here when, when coming to our conclusion. It doesn't mean that all of them by, far, by any means are coming to the same conclusion as the court in the, in the Netherlands, but there is a narrative currently being formed from many courts across the world that sort of points in a very similar direction. And I think that in and of itself is an interesting development. Whether or not that will spill over to international investment arbitration, it remains to be seen. This is very, this is very important because we are looking here at the, at, at the, at the sources and we look at the uh, legal framework, uh, soft law, hard law, whatever we have there, which is obviously uh, changing or at least in the process of uh, being modernized. But one important part of this are the already in the public domain decisions, awards by uh, arbitral tribunals. Uh, so what is the role of, of uh, this uh, publication of, of awards, the access to this, uh, to this rulings and, and of course, uh, if there is any precedent uh, and, and we look now at uh, over 1,000 cases. Uh, so I, I think coming from the past to the future, uh, one needs uh, a, a good manpower to go through all this uh, decision. So Lucas, uh, back to you on the last topic. Yes, and, and as you know, Karina, I debated whether to use slides or not, but because from what you realize my voice is not ideal today. I think as I think using some visualization might be uh, reasonably helpful, but uh, I assure you that I will stay within my time. So looking at sort of at, at new and old sources with particular focus on the publication of awards, um, um, which is also sort of, I, I, if you wish, I have tried to give a subtitle as the, the price of transparency. I think the, the old sources, the traditional sources of law are classical international law, which means either treaties or customer international law, and then perhaps there's a debate here about general principles of law or general principles of law um, known to civilized nations, uh, this uh, rather parochial um, terminology in the statute of the International Court of Justice. And then we have national law, typical of that of the host state. In some cases, also the law of the alleged nationality of the investor, 
um, especially when you have to make a determination as to whether the investor has the nationality that the investor alleges that it has. And last but not least, in the context of a particular concession agreement, we have to look at the contract. Now, the reality is now that we have had in excess of a thousand um, ISTS cases, um, of which um, uh, perhaps nearly 600 to 700 are published. Um, so the, I think the, the question is that the publication of, of the awards um, has made awards um, a de facto source of law. And, and that's a very interesting conundrum because although theoretically, and we have said it ever again, and I teach that every time I teach the particular subject, that we don't have a doctrine of precedent in international law, the reality is very different from the theory. I mean, to, to sort of, to, to use sort of Popper's analogy, we have effectively a falsification of that theory that in international law, we don't have any precedent. Simply because I have not seen many awards that do not cite other awards. And I have not seen any submission um, that it doesn't cite any um, a, a award which is uh, favorable to a particular position. Of course, the, the, the debate here is, is, is a debate which has a bit of a cultural context or cultural baggage, if, if one were to use that expression. Um, because um, a, a president from a common law perspective departs from a, uh, from a basis of um, uh, stare decisis um, and, and of course a hierarchy of tribunals. Um, but of course the, 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 the form of um, uh, president we have in investment arbitration, arbitration is the form of president that is known to civil law systems. So, um, as you know, we say that um, Germany, France do not recognize the doctrine of president, but you can't open a, a textbook that would not have references to cases. Um, um, so, therefore, that persuasive value of awards, that civil law concept of precedent, um, has really um, been um, a, a point of, of reference now. Um, of course, the fact that so many awards are being published and there's so much information um, ab about how tribunals approach particular provisions um, of, of a treaty or looked at how the facts um, um, are, um, are applied to the treaty um, has have also introduced a level of dynamism in treaty interpretation. Um, and, and I'm saying that because um, uh, both with a positive and a negative um, comment. Uh, the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, of course, is being applied very often by tribunals, but is very rare, um, uh, uh, and, and it's disappointingly so, that you will open an award that, uh, that refers to the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties specifically, and you will find the guidance they provide as to the application useful. The only thing they say is, we apply Article 31 or Article 32, and that's our conclusion. There's not much about the argumentation the positions and, and, and etc. The other thing which is a bit interesting about how the uh, interpretation is being applied these days, and, and especially by, by, by the body of, of, of case law that is available to us, is that treaties <clears throat> um, reflect the intention of the parties at the time when the treaty has been made. And therefore, treaty interpretation should reflect um, the particular intention of the parties at when the, the treaty was made. But we've seen that a lot of tribunals, particularly, for example, in matters like uh, one example I will use specifically is MFN clauses, are, are likely to use awards which go differently. So you have um, an, an MFN clause in a BIT which has no asterisk, no restriction, not for, for, for greater certainty. And then they say you cannot use dispute settlement or procedural matters um, because that's the way the MFN clause discussion is moving on. So. This dynamic interpretation is not what the drafters of the treaties wanted. Um, the treaties are um, um, made by states and only states can, can change them. But I see sometimes tribunals have an intention to change them, even with submission of states in, in some respects. And then, of course, we have all of these new and alternative sources. Um, I think it doesn't come to, as a surprise to anyone uh, on this um, um, uh, Zoom meeting that soft law has become hard law through awards, um, but of course this is not controversial. We always accept that soft law, at least from the 1960s and, and, and later has become a, a source of law, is reflected in the Hague courses and so on. 
But of course, what the more the more interesting or controversial issue might be that we have now a number of alternative sources. We have a number of guidelines, um, which are not a such soft law, but guidelines have a much lighter, um, it's not the codification of custom that soft law is often is. We have interpretative statements by states. If you look at NAFTA, USMCA, and the, and, and, and the Free Trade Commission, where we have had um, sort of a, a clear intentions by states to define FET, uh, and particularly the relation of FET to customer international law. Now, these are state declarations, um, which we never anticipated in the past that they would be having some sort of law. And we have to see them as are they commentary, are they reform, are, are they revision of the treaty? The legal nature of such documents is, is a matter of debate. And, and of course, one would be um, advised that they only have, um, uh, they only apply for future disputes, but not in the current cases. And we've seen in, in a number of cases that states have intervened, including the, the, the US in, in a recent case, trying to propose an interpretation of the treaty as a definitive statement and not being willing that this um, interpretation of, of the treaty as proposed by the United States can be debated by the tribunal and the parties and the council of the parties to the dispute. So, so we have a bit of sort of um, um, maneuvering and sort of um, uh, elbowing sort of tribunals by trying to, to give our version. So, so all of that, um, plus the two other documents that I'm going, the two other sources I'm going to mention, create what I will call the, the new travel preparatoire. Um, and of course, apologies for the typo there, no preparatoire is written, the I should be before the R rather than afterwards. Um, um, so we have a lot of um, documents and concept papers produced now by the Academic Forum for, for ISDS. A lot of these documents are produced to order by the Ancestral Working Group 3. Um, which is a working group. It's not, it's not a governmental sort of um, um, uh, uh, request as such. And we have, of course, a lot of other policy interventions. Look, the way the working group three in Ancestral works, um, a lot of comments and statements are being made by individuals. If you look at the code of conduct, a lot of the responses were by individuals and not by organizations. So all of these documents are now part of the, um, of the sources that are being considered while the debate is taking place and why the discussion is taking taking place, and they are de facto the proper part of this um, uh, of of this new document instrument that Arsenal will create. Um, what value will we give to them in in the sense that a lot of the debate seems to be perhaps moving a bit away from the procedural reform only um, back and forth, not necessarily in one direction. Um, all of these alternative sources would create perhaps a bit of a, of a headache for, for future tribunals or future investment court systems, whatever the future might hold. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, if Annette or, or Mauro would like to add to this. Okay, if Annette doesn't start, <laughs> just make a comment. Certainly, um, Knowing all the awards, being able to consult them is, uh, in the abstract, extremely useful. If this means that one should decide based on someone else's decision, and I'm not sure I can follow that. They are a good support. Um, I have had the opportunity of seeing conflicting views, opposite views, by some tribunals. I experienced that and then even rendered a dissenting opinion in an exit arbitration, for example, concerning, among the various items, the right of the host state to make a counterclaim. So another reason for which I would uh, not share the view that the dream um, is to come to a stereotypicized status is that the class of arbitrators is extremely heterogeneous. You have very learned scholars, former judges, um, friends of one of the litigants, and therefore uh, it would be difficult to say that the decision of a close friend of one of the litigants should in some way oblige someone else, in particular someone who studies arbitration, uh, to follow it. So. Uh, 
On the top of that, we have the confidentiality rule. I'm not giving personally such big importance to confidentiality to me. People do not go to arbitration except in special cases just because of confidentiality. But nevertheless, this is the point. What one can do and is doing on some occasions is to abstract from the decision, the point of law, not mentioning the parties that perhaps could be useful. And in that sense, uh, it would be good if we were working together. But as you know, uh, the arbitration world is not frequently united. I think it was very, uh, um, I can agree with, uh, with Lucas' observations in terms of uh, uh, never having seen sort of a, a case where you do not refer to other decisions in the investment arbitration or you see the submissions that they, it, this is really the reality and this is a practical reality. It, although in theory, there, uh, something else could be said and I fully agree with that. Uh, and it is an interesting scenario that you're painting up in terms of all this additional travel that will, will potentially have an importance uh, going forward. Where will the, that take us? I, thought it all, I suppose it all illustrates how, um, again, international law is a moving target. It's whatever the, the, the actors within that system, uh, and which are not always united, as we know, whatever they decide where to take it. Um, and just picking up on the point on transparency and to... Um, uh, tying in again sort of the climate change perspective, I think there could be an extra value of adding uh, an extra ambition for transparency when it comes to investments that are directly related to uh, meeting the climate change challenge. Because uh, given the fact that we are in a point in time where we don't have that much time, where we really need to learn faster from our previous mistakes, that could be an extra reason to actually share the experiences from our failed deals, if you like. Uh, and, and to be generous about it. And when I say we, obviously, I mean the corporates, but, but to be generous about that, because uh, so we're in, in, um, in another world in, in where we would, did not have short time, maybe there you could take a full-fledged arbitration and, uh, and drive it all the way and just you know, carve out all the legal details, whereas now we might have to approach it differently, uh, both in terms of how much you share so others can learn from our, our mistakes and not go to, uh, to the same... Um, traps if you like or if or make the same technical mistakes or design their their, their technical structure differently or what have you uh, so that could be one way we could do it but another one could also be that we maybe there is here in this point in time a stronger argument for using alternative forms of dispute resolution to to have mediation used to a larger extent again to get this thing concluded faster and get on with it because we only have nine years until 2030 and we, we, we just need to get work faster. So there could be additional layers being added on to how we approach the disputes the, and that makes, makes actors approach them differently than otherwise would have been the case. It, it's quite right to me that investment arbitration is a special case because it involves um, the situation, the status uh, of, a, of a country, and therefore its citizens sometimes uh, rightly feel they want to be informed. Uh, we all know the Australian litigation on this issue, and therefore, apart from the ancestral rules and the Mauritius Convention, uh, there is a public interest. The citizen is entitled to know. He must not be a passive observer of what is done by state. So in, in that respect, it uh, um, seems to me that it could be more useful than I said before to have something along this line in investment arbitration. I do not know whether Lucas agrees. No, I, I, th I think state interest um, and, 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 and accountability is a significant part uh, and, and I, I I, I think I am still persuaded by the debate of the 1960s that ISDS or investment arbitration, which is the correct term, offers a depoliticized way of resolving the disputes. And, and at the same time, if the allegation is that a particular government doesn't meet the, the, the rule of law or, or, or transparency in the national standards that none would like, overall, most tribunals when they know that the award will be published, um, they function as a, as, a, as a better governance system than any domestic law or any domestic court. 
I, I, in similar, I think in a similar debate, you would never expect to see as long a decision as you, in a national court as you see from an arbitration tribunal, to say the least. Or, or long submissions. Um, yes, or long submissions, yes. <laughs> But, but one, one question, and, and I'm mindful to the fact that we have many questions in our Q&A. Uh, one follow-up um, point, uh, and perhaps uh, more, more directed to Mauro, uh, one of the proposed um, solutions in the context of ISDS reform of the Working Group 3 is this uh, multilaterally advisory center, um, which would wear uh, many hats, but obviously it's still uh, under construction and, and probably will be more refined uh, in, in, uh, in the next uh, two, three years. One of them is capacity building. Uh, and I, it's not only raising awareness, but also mapping all these uh, sources, including, uh, I would say, awards. Uh, do you think this could uh, maybe be a turning point for ISDS or it's something that was missing? It's difficult to read the future. Uh, the status of this center um, is, let's say, rather open. <coughs> you find an advisory role, the possibility to run mediation proceedings and to represent parties in arbitration. Now, uh, if states criticize uh, lawyers for being double-headed. Now, in that case, they are triple-headed. So they will have to limit their dreams and select one of them. If they remain faithful, loyal to their title, they will be advisory. And probably a lot of developing countries, indeed, even some small and middle-sized states need some help. And that would be good. But one thing is advising, the other one is representing, and inevitably another one is judging. So uh, it seems to me that the working group of the UNCITRAL uh, may have still a long way to find its final direction. And then if it's advisory, it would be good. Advising would not change to me life. The basic decision of the same before is do the states want arbitration or they want a public arbitration, so commercial arbitration or public arbitration than a court? And that may be the future, assuming that uh, the bull will be taken by the horns in order to make a decision. This would add another stakeholder uh, to, to this uh, generous landscape, I would say. Uh, let me just ask uh, one, uh, I think we have time for maybe two questions before we, we end the very interesting discussion, obviously, uh, we have limited time. Uh, we have one from uh, one of our attendees, it's an anonymous question. Um, we have seen that many investment tribunals tried their best to avoid applying human rights law or even environmental law when the investor is involved in some violations and instead focus merely on the commercial aspect. How can we avoid investment tribunals being seen as an international court while addressing or considering important questions in relation to human rights and the environment? I'm not sure if in the current setting or in the future proposed multilateral investment court, uh, but uh, I think that's, uh, if anyone. Um I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree with the very basic premise of the question that tribunals seem to be avoiding human rights questions. Um, uh, again, um, in human rights, certain human rights are designed to be relied upon by individuals as against the state. And then, of course, there are three generations of human rights or four, arguably, depending on, on what uh, school of thought in human rights do you follow, where there will be human rights which have a direct effect horizontal effect. But for example, um, to use an investment arbitration system for a failure, perhaps, of, a, of an investor to comply with uh, environmental obligations under a particular human rights convention or a constitution, I'm not sure whether the right way to do that or whether this is a matter that has to be done within a, a domestic constitution, uh, domestic law or, or, or court or domestic constitutional court. And, and, and there, then there are a couple of these cases which was the blending. If you look at uh, if you look at Vattenfall, if you look at Ackerman, if you look at Yukos, uh, all of these cases had life within constitutional courts, 
interestingly enough, all of them in favor of the investor, and live within um, uh, our ISDS uh, systems, um, where certain aspects of human rights have been assessed differently. Of course, um, uh, the, diff the big difference between the European Court of Human Rights and, and, and the UCOS Tribunal is, is, is the, the, the confidence that the tribunal had to award very high damages with the, Euro the European Court would never do that. But um, I, I don't see that there's a particular hesitation. I think sometimes human rights comes as a sort of a, um, a, a defense by the state, but it's not technically substantiated. And, and I think that's why that we don't see more human rights discussion. In the environmental arena, and, and even in commercial cases relating to sort of oil exploration or extractive industries, uh, I know anecdotally that there's a, a few more human rights cases where tribunals have not had any hesitation to address the question, if they thought it's something where they had, there was appropriate standing before them to approach it. The, the other question, uh, maybe in the in the in the next minute or so, uh, refers to uh, one of the issues with uh, ISDS that is raised, uh, that is arbitrators. And uh, Lucas was referring to the code of conduct. Uh, Mauro as well uh, mentioned the double hatting. The question we have um, is the double hatting a particular issue in ISDS, while arbitrator in one case may produce a precedent useful for another case in which uh, she serves as counsel, how this might affect the legitimacy of the ISDS and its authorities. I mean, this is an ongoing debate, obviously, but I think, I think better put is how can we reconcile the fact that there is a request to have consistency in ISDS, but at the same time, we do not want uh, the maybe this, this uh, particular situations involving arbitrators uh, or to be excluded, rather, uh, from ISDS? Uh, whether this is typical of investment arbitration, I would say no. It happens every day, in my opinion, in commercial arbitration. And uh, double hatting is nothing compared to what the French call copinage. And sometimes you have a feeling that uh, there is uh, some intent, some intention, some uh, liking between two of the three arbitrators, which allows to see the result. And this, according to criticism, is sometimes due to the fact that one of these arbitrators hopes to be reappointed by the other arbitrator if he makes him happy. This is very, very bad. So, <laughs> Is there any cure for that? Difficult to say. To me, the final issue is probably the professional arbitrator has to be regulated. And as they do in the UK uh, with a chartered institute, we would need in the interest of users to have certified arbitrators. And the other one, one can appoint the butcher, can appoint his publican, can appoint his girlfriend, but uh, one would know that whether he is or is not a certified arbitrator. I don't know whether I replied, but that's a, a, a sincere comment. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. Uh, I think we are on time. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, our attendees, uh, and, and I'm very happy to say that uh, all, all in place from the first minute until the last, um, we, we, we speed up through the past, present, and future of uh, uh, ISDS. And hopefully, we'll all be here uh, for the next editions of Jus Mundi Agora to discuss, to still discuss investment arbitration and ISDS, probably with a new face, uh, or at least uh, uh, as an evolved system uh, or evolving system. And I would like to thank uh, Annette, uh, Mauro, and Lucas for their uh, uh, interesting, absolutely lively conversation today, and also for their time, and uh, to our attendees for staying with us, uh, and uh, Yus Mundi for uh, reuniting us today, right before the summer holiday. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I wish you an excellent weekend ahead, excellent summer, 
and uh, see you soon. Same to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.